Xbox. The lone newcomer that stepped into the console race during the sixth generation of video game consoles to take the place of Sega, whom decided to bow out of the hardware business for good. Microsoft had some big shoes to fill, but after outselling Nintendo's GameCube by the end of the generation, with minimal support from Japan no less, I'd say they did a pretty good fucking job. Around the turn of the century, gaming was becoming more mainstream instead of being just a niche hobby and exposure to the internet was on the upswing thanks to broadband. Linked to both of these was the prevalent presence of CD burners along with programs like Clone CD that could circumvent the copy protection on PC games by making an exact copy of the fake bad sectors on CD-ROMs used to protect the game data. Or if that didn't work, you could always hop on your screaming fast cable modem and download a cracked executable file that bypassed the CD check altogether. On the other hand, with consoles, emulation was not as widespread as it is today, and ultimately, purchasing game consoles and their software was still a necessity. As a result, developers saw more money in the console business than in the PC business where they blamed rampant piracy for a continuous loss of sales. Kind of like today. Not only that, but developers and publishers alike started to really focus on the new hardware and video game consoles that was closing the gap between the hardware found in PCs at the time. On the flip side of the coin, we saw releases of extremely popular PC games that still hold up today, including Counter-Strike, Diablo 2, Deus Ex, and The Sims. It was only natural someone would eventually try to merge the convenient simplicity of a game console with the graphics power of a Windows computer. Back in 1998, a team of four engineers from Microsoft's DirectX team took apart various Dell PCs to try and put together a set of hardware to compete with Sony's next system, which was being highly anticipated as the next big thing in the industry to the point of luring many future titles away from the Windows platform. As always, Microsoft wanted a piece of the pie too. They would eventually approach Ed Fries, who was overseeing game publishing at Microsoft at the time, with the idea of a dedicated DirectX game console. Fries saw the potential in this idea and gave them the green light by backing the project. The name was simplified to Xbox in the marketing phase of the device, and in true tradition of passing the torch in a way, Sega would go on to create a bunch of exclusives strictly for Microsoft's console. After all, Microsoft helped create Windows CE for the Dreamcast around the same time. It's very important to get the information out now that the, the world's best game developers will have the next year to create unbelievable games. From announcing the Xbox, uh, which we're modestly titling the future of console gaming. We wanted to make a platform that was designed by game developers for game developers. And so what better place than to deliver it to the home of game developers at GDC? So 18 months out, you have to go to developers, talk to them about the platform, talk about the tools and the architecture, so that when the product ships, there are amazing games available. But on November the 8th, in the North American market, you'll be able to go into retail stores, and you'll be able to get a box just like this with Xbox in it. This is going to be a momentous event for the industry and for Microsoft, and we're very excited about that. Xbox will launch in North America on November 8th. We're excited to report that we're going to have 50 to 100 percent more units than Sony had with their PlayStation 2 launch. And for $299, people are going to be super excited by what they get, and we know we're going to be able to sell as many units as we can produce. Our secret weapon for Xbox is its online game capabilities. It's the only console designed from the ground up to be perfect for broadband online gaming. And that is the future of gaming and we think is going to bring some very exciting things to people who love to play games. Microsoft's Xbox launched on November 15, 2001, with a secret weapon that neither Sony nor Nintendo could compete with at the time, 
a re-imaging of Bungie's Halo Combat Evolved as a first-person shooter that capitalized on the success of popular console games from the previous generation, such as GoldenEye 007, Perfect Dark, the Turok series, and Medal of Honor. While the Xbox received lukewarm acceptance in Japan, it had a successful launch in the rest of the world and would become a mainstay with the eventual release of Halo 2 and Xbox Live. Thanks to the announcement of the Xbox 360 in 2005 and a lawsuit settlement with Nvidia back in 2002, the original iterations of the Xbox and Xbox Live would be discontinued in 2007 and 2010 respectively. We all know this now, but my personal experience with the Xbox didn't start until the middle of 2002 with a small group of friends from high school. We all enjoyed video games, all on the shiny new and amazing piece of technology that was Sony's PlayStation 2 at the time, and coincidentally, were also pretty big into PC games. Eventually, my friends introduced me to one of their other friends who had graduated a year before we did and ended up hanging out at his house to play this new thing called an Xbox. And what can I say about the Xbox? It's an interesting... Wait, what? This is the controller? That's oh, too heavy. The controller is too big, the buttons are too small, and this enormous attention whore of a logo jewel in the middle is just obnoxious. Did they think the system and the games were going to be so fucking amazing that you would get ADD to the point of forgetting what system you were playing on until you look back down at the 20 pound monstrosity that your hands were awkwardly cupped around? Seriously, this lug had the Guinness World Record for largest controller for its time. Thank God the system had its Japanese launch three months later, because that prompted Microsoft to release the smaller S controllers for the Japanese, which is ironic since the S controller fits perfectly into my big hands. As far as the system goes, a lot of people like to rip on how big the system is, but there was a legitimate reason for that. Not only did the Xbox have actual PC components in it, but it completely invalidated buying memory cards since it came with a hard drive it would just save games to. This was an awesome innovation, since having to buy memory cards and keeping track of all of them was a pain in the ass. Alright, so this is the Xbox here. I pulled them off of my uh, entertainment center to take a closer look at them for you guys. And this is by far probably the bulkiest console you'll ever see. Um, I have it, my 360 here right off camera, but just looking at the Xbox, I mean, it's pretty no frills. The biggest thing about it is it's heavy as fuck, and you can see where the DirectX influence came from, where there, it's kind of an X pattern on the top of it with the jewel in the middle. Um, you know, because the jewel on the controller wasn't big enough, so we needed one in the fucking console too. So you definitely know what system you're playing with, right? So this is the front of it. Um, you got your four controller ports here. You got the power button under the eject button, which brings the disk drive out here. Um, speaking of the disk drive, one of the biggest problems with the Xbox was the uh, optical drives by far. A lot of the early models shipped with Thomson drives that were notorious for disk reading errors and stuff like that. So what Microsoft did in subsequent prints of the console was they put new uh, optical drives in the console. Um, they split it into two models this time. There was a Philips drive and there was a newer Thompson drive, but they were still kind of 50-50 with the quality as far as how they'd read discs. But in the later runs with the Xbox, I believe in the last runs of it, they put in Samsung drives, and this is one here. Um, my console in particular, I don't have it hooked up now, um, but you can probably imagine how it would be pictured. Uh, the disk drive has a problem opening and closing sometimes. Um, I don't know if it's the belt in the drive itself or what. I haven't really taken it apart and looked at it or looked at guides online, but uh, it has no problem reading discs. It's just it has a problem when you press the eject button. Uh, the door has a problem opening and closing, but I got this at a flea market for 25 bucks with a controller, a game, and the cable, so I'm not really complaining. I'm just glad it turns on at all. Uh, as you can see, nothing on the sides. Just a little uh, design here. And if we look at the back, it's pretty no frills as well. Ethernet port, because in 2001 when this console came out, 
uh, home wireless networks weren't nearly as widespread as they are now, and they're not, they weren't as popular. So you needed to hook in an Ethernet cable, which goes to your router, which goes to your uh, modem or your internet connection. This is where uh, the AV cable goes in. Uh, if you have a component cable, a high definition cable, it would go in here as well. Um, and this is where the power cord would come out. And this is obviously the fan for the cooling system. And this is how it would compare. I have my 360 right here. If I can zoom out a little bit. Uh, as you can see, the 360, I have the 360S. I'll go into a little bit of detail about it later in the video. Uh, it's a little, sh it's a little uh, uh, lighter, a little less bulky than the uh, the uh, original Xbox here. Um, uh, this isn't the original model. I think the original model was as big as this, but probably not as heavy because um, I don't uh, have the tools readily available to take this apart. But right under here, if you can picture inside of a computer, if you've ever seen that, um, there's a, a full-size optical drive here, there's a full-size hard drive right here, and there's a whole uh, motherboard beneath the surface, obviously, that you would see in a computer. So it was really like having a mini computer, which was the first for its time, and uh, as far as the console race goes. Anyway, to continue my personal perspective towards this new Titanic alien box, it was both mysterious and impressive at the same time to see a brand new system on the market, especially since it completely came in under the radar to me. Seriously, I had no idea this thing was out, and when I saw it, I didn't know what the fuck it was. On the other hand, after doing some reading on it and eventually seeing the string of games coming out for it, I wrote it off as being a quote-unquote poor man's PC, since the majority of software that was released for it was either already on the PC or coming out for the PC in one form or another. Besides, if you had a PC with a decent video card in it, why in the blue fuck would you drop $300 on a console that plays shitty versions of PC games? Why not put that money toward a PS2 or a GameCube and play games that are otherwise inaccessible on a PC altogether? The only time I would ever play it is at get-togethers with my friends, which included memorizing all of the maps and weapon spawns in Halo, learning counterattacks and character weaknesses in Dead or Alive 3, and making snack runs to the nearest Kroger at 3 in the morning. Ah, the good old days. Eventually, the novelty wore off, time went on, and we all went back to our PCs. Fast forward to late last year when gaming on the PC was getting boring to me personally, and I decided to go back to a simpler time with a new perspective toward gaming. So, I bought an Xbox 360. And the funny thing is, after dogging on the Xbox for years and years by letting ignorant people on the internet reinforce my likewise ignorant, poor man's PC sentiment, and reading horror stories about the Red Ring of Death, I decided it was time to man up. I wanted to sit down and have some one-on-one -on -one time with the system so I can formulate my own opinion about Microsoft's green and black box of wonders. After spending a bit of time with it, I can say my opinion of the platform has definitely improved. I've always known the controller is great from having one hooked up to my PC for years. Not only are wireless controllers one of those how did I ever get by without this in the past inventions, especially now that it works a lot better than it did in the past, but the ergonomics of the actual controller itself are impressive. It's just comfortable and natural to play with for most games. For the console itself, the new S models that redesigned the motherboard layout and cooling system are prone to hardware failure nearly as much as the older revisions are. The interface on the dashboard is slick and easy to maneuver around in, and the popularity of Xbox Live for multiplayer gaming is second to none. People love to compare it to Sony's PlayStation Network, which is free, and has a few strengths of its own, but three things. One, the majority of games made today are made with the Xbox architecture in mind due to the development cycle. That's just the way it is. You either love it or you hate it. Two, Xbox Live is not only more robust, but has a higher population of gamers. And three, with the constant subscription sales from places like Amazon, Best Buy, Walmart, and even Microsoft themselves that they run throughout the year, you will never end up spending $60 a year on the service. Which is another ignorant thought I used myself against having to give the Xbox the time of day, and maybe back the PS3 at first, until I saw the strengths that Microsoft's platform had to bring to the table. Seriously, I've let my gold subscription on uh, Live expire two or three times now, and when you turn on the Xbox and they downgrade you back to silver status, they have ads that they run right when you turn the system on that say, uh, 
you know, you can get a, a month of live for a dollar or two months for two dollars. I remember doing that once or twice. So you're never going to fucking pay sixty dollars a year for this service. And anyone who swears you're, you're going to spend a sixty dollar a year price tag on live is either retarded, a Sony fanboy, or a retarded Sony fanboy. So, as much as I like the Xbox 360, it's not without its issues. My biggest gripe would have to be the graphical horsepower of the system itself. As mentioned before, I've played PC games for a long time, and I was used to playing games fluidly with their graphics settings either maxed out or very close to that level. I've always been a stickler for eye candy and experiencing everything a game has to offer. It didn't feel like the complete experience unless I could see every detail the developers intended their audience to see. Yet on the 360, it feels like being stuck in a fucking time loop from 2006, playing games powered by DirectX 9 graphics over and over and over again. We're now halfway through 2012, and are well set into the prowess and sophistication of high definition, which includes gaming at 1080p. We're long overdue for an upgrade, and I'm hoping against hope we're presented with new hardware from Sony and Microsoft next year to really kick off the next generation of game consoles. Look, I get that consoles will always be a step behind the power that a home-built PC can offer so they can keep the cost down on these things, but this thing is fucking almost seven years old. It's the technological equivalent of an Egyptian pyramid, for God's sake. It did what it has set out to do, but now it's time to move on. We want something new. But that's the future. I want to talk about the past. I'm in the late terminal stages of sprite love without a cure, have to stop myself from typing MemMaker to run Wolf 3D from a command prompt, have a strong hankering for Jill sandwiches, remember when 3D accelerator cards were the new thing, and still occasionally hum the Waterland theme from Super Mario Bros. 3 unconsciously, and I don't want it any other way. With my refreshed perspective towards the Xbox and yours truly being forever captivated by the phenomenon known as retro gaming before loving the classics was even a thing, I decided to revisit big old black and green from 2001 for myself to not only play the Xbox's established franchises from the beginning, but to play other underrated gems that I missed out on. I was fortunate to find a system a few months ago for a very affordable price. I cleaned it out, spruced it up, snagged a component cable for it, and I'm currently collecting a spare set of controllers for it as we speak. So buckle up, YouTube. We'll start screaming down memory lane very soon. Thanks for watching. And that's my mantra.